Hello, hello everyone. I'm really, really pleased to have you with us for what is a, a kickoff event. Um, so I'm Wendy, Wendy Purcell. I'm the series editor for Higher Education and the Sustainable Development Goals. And this is the um, kickoff event for the webinar series that's going to accompany the book series. Uh, we're delighted to be doing this in partnership with SDSN Youth and Emerald Publishing. And we're really, really pleased to be part of the Transforming Education Summit, particularly because the theme of today is actually youth mobilization. And the core feature of the book is the student voice. So um, I'm going to hand over to our commissioning editor. So that's Katie Mathers from Emerald Publishing, who'll tell you a little bit about the series. Then I'll hand back to Brighton Kaoma from SDSN Youth. And then we're going to hear from some of our editors as well as some of their students. So um, really pleased to have you with us. Um, let me now hand over to Katie. Katie. Thank you very much, Wendy. Um, so yeah, I'm thrilled to be here to represent Emerald Publishing and be partnering with Wendy, Brighton and SDSN Youth in this venture to put youth voices in dialogue with editors and authors from our upcoming book series, Higher Education and the Sustainable, Sustainable Development Goals. So as the commissioning editor here at Emerald for this exciting new book series, I just wanted to take some time to talk about Emerald's commitment to SDG aligned and impactful research and contextualize our commission of the Higher Education and the Sustainable Development Goals series, as well as our partnership with SDSM Youth in this new webinar series. So, at Emerald, we strive to be a home for research that achieves attention, reach, and real world impact. We recognize that it's essential that publishers help to further change in academia, but that we should also be looking to support research that can make a difference to society. So in 2018, we launched our Real Impacts Manifesto, which introduced our commitment to publish research, which makes a difference, and invest further in the research community to support real world change as well as tra challenge traditional metrics of impact and drive impact literacy. In 2019, we became an early signatory of DORA, which is the Declaration on Research Assessment, which recognizes the need to improve the ways in which researchers and the outputs of scholarly research are evaluated. Since then, we've been looking to publish the best social, social science research that's aligned to the sustainable development goals and has real impact. We signed the SDG Publishers Compact as a founding signatory in December 2020. And signing the compact was the natural next step in our journey towards reimagining content beyond the article and curating content that aligns to UN SDGs and that has a mission focus. The Publisher Compact recognizes the importance that part and role that publishers can play in advancing progress towards achieving the SDGs by 2030. Signatories commit to 10 action points, aiming to develop sustainable practices and act as champions of the SDGs during the decade of action. So these commitments include such uh, examples such as public, publicly committing to the SDGs, promoting and inquiring SDG content, being an SDG advocate to customers and stakeholders, and collaborating across cities, countries and continents. Um, so at the end of 2020, we created four Emerald Goals based on our analysis of funding, research and our own content strengths upon which we can build. And these are fairer society, healthier lives, responsible management and quality education for all, each of which are mapped to the SDGs. And this was us taking a step towards walking the talk and being truly mission led and trying to attract the best social science research that's going to have real societal impact. The aim is to create our content across SDG missions and themes to allow researchers to surface relevant scholarship related to their mission-led research. For each of the, our goals, we have an advisor, and I'm delighted to say that Wendy is our advisor for Fair Society, and we're thrilled to partner with Wendy in this endeavor, as well as her role as series as her series editor of Higher Education and the Sustainable Development Goals. So bringing this back to the book series, which frames our discussion today, I hope this short presentation has given exciting content, context as to why we commissioned the series. The aim of the series is to provide a cutting edge solutions based approach to the role of higher education in accel accelerating fulfillment of the SDG Agenda 2030 programme and beyond. Um, and Wendy will soon talk about the series in more detail, but I'm keen to highlight now a hugely important part of the series will be emphasizing the student voice and we're really excited to be partnering with SDSN youth to put that agenda at the fore 
with this webinar series. The conversation about the role of higher education as a mobiliser of change could not be more pressing. And as a home of mission-led impactful research, this series is at the heart of the work that we want to do. So thank you very much for listening. Um, and I'll now pass back to Wendy. Thank you. That's excellent. Thank you so much, Katie. And thank you so much for the invitation to uh, to be the series editor for, for this suite of uh, 17 books. It's quite audacious uh, challenge um, and uh, a wonderful community, I think, that we're assembling. And I think it, the premise really is that what higher education is doing in the world really matters. And so um, I really feel that the voice of higher education is so critical uh, in this space and the work that we do, and particularly with our students. Um, I think it was said brilliantly by uh, Jeff Sachs, uh, president of the uh, SDSN network, really, that the idea that we partner clearly with our students, but we partner with other organizations to really take on uh, the challenges of sustainable development and, and really help create a world that leaves no one behind. So what we do here really matters. And therefore the, the kind of challenge for the book series is really to capture that essence of higher education and the work we're doing to support delivery of the sustainable development goals critical in the series and I think a distinctive feature of the series is the way we're asking each of our editors to draw out the impact of the student voice um, and they're doing that in a number of ways you know the dialogue that students are having one with each other and that's a global dialogue the sense of amplifying their voice for change and transformation and then the way that they're working in partnership with each other and I think we're seeing that all the way through uh, the book series and it's something we want to really draw out in this webinar series for this webinar series to be a place where the student voice is again uh, engaged in dialogue engaged in amplifying that voice and also the partnership that that brings. I want to tell you just a uh, uh, very small amount about the book series, just to introduce you to some of my incredible uh, community of authors and uh, uh, the editors here. So far, uh, we have nine of the 17 books commissioned. And so really excited to see that. We expect the first book in the series to be number 17, and we'll be hearing um, about that. So you'll see uh, President Professor Angle Cabrera from uh, George Tech uh, with his co-editor, Drew Kurtwright, um, who will be talking to us a little bit about uh, their plans for, for that book. I'm also really pleased to have today our editor for book 16, uh, Ambassador Professor Sarah Mendelssohn, together with one of her students. Um, so we'll be hearing a little bit more about that later on as well. Uh, Simon Davies, Emeritus Professor, will be the uh, editor for SDG 14. Uh, Stacey Kennedy, uh, Professor, uh, will be the editor for SDG 13, so from the University of the West Indies, bringing all of her networks there. And then for uh, SDG 12, we have Drs. Uh, Romas Malevicus and also Beatrice Acevo. Uh, great to see them uh, bringing some ideas for responsible consumption. You'll be hearing later on from Julio Lumbreras uh, and his co-editor, Jamie, who can't be with us, but one of his students is with us to talk about SDG 11. And it's wonderful to have Ardeth, uh, Dr. Ardeth Barnett, who will be looking after SDG 7. Uh, Kadisha, Dr. Kadisha Kalsum who will be looking after SDG 5, and I think she's with us in the audience, so welcome, Kadisha. Um, and then uh, President Tawane Coupe, who is the uh, president of the University of Pretoria, uh, will be with us on video, and together with his colleagues, um, Brian Chickson and his student as well. So we're really pleased to be able, just to give you a window into um, what these books are about, the role of the student voice. You'll hear from some of the students who are involved in the books or are contributing to the scholarship um, of higher education in this space. Um, and so I'm going to um, 
really invite you too to be thinking about some of the books we've yet to commission. Um, so these are the ones that are still open. We're looking both for chapter authors, for editors, uh, contributions from our students. So please do reach out to me or to Katie if you are interested in being involved in this incredible uh, project. Um, I'm now going to uh, stop sharing my screen and invite uh, Brighton Kamer, who is the Global Director for the United Nations Sustainable Development Solutions Network. And it's really the partnership uh, at the invitation of Brighton that we're here today and launching this webinar series. So Brighton, can I hand over to you? Thank you so much, Wendy. And uh, a very good morning, good afternoon to everybody, depending on where we, you're joining us from today. I'm extremely delighted that uh, today we are meeting to discuss and launch what is going to be an exciting series, bringing together an intergenerational coterie of young people and leaders in higher education. Today, as most of you are aware, is the Youth Mobilization Day as part of the Transforming Education Summit. And the essence of today is to convey the collective recommendations of youth on transforming education to decision makers and policy makers. And all this is informed by the Youth Declaration, which is going to be launched today. And we're very excited to see the Youth Declaration that has been created as a result of contribution from young people world over. So we're really thrilled and excited to be able to come to this day, see young people getting involved, but most importantly, collaborate with uh, Emerald Publishing, uh, Professor Wendy Parcell of Harvard University, but also young people from across 127 countries where SDSN Youth is currently active. It also gives me great pleasure to recognize that we had a very unique time in history where the world is witnessing 1.8 billion young people and these are vital agents of positive change for the realization of Agenda 2030. However, we continue to see structural barriers, slow economic development, inequality, as well as political instability that tends to undermine the social prospects for youth. SDSN Youth has over the last five years worked at the intersection of innovation, education for sustainable development, urban sustainability, and human rights, working with 4,100 young people across 127 countries. And what we recognize as an organization is that for us to be able to equip young people with 21st century skills, we need to understand that giving them the opportunities to understand the sustainable development goals, understand the challenges of their communities, understand pathways of how to make change, and ultimately takes action is critical to realizing the goals. As SDSN youth, we have since 2015 incubated over 500 uh, startups, trained over 30, 700 young leaders as SDG adv advocates. We've also partnered with over 100 higher learning institutions where most of our programs run. So this launch today gives me immense privilege because it's going to give a huge opportunity to many young leaders out there, allowing them to have a seat at the table. And at the same time, giving them an opportunity for them to contribute to producing content and producing the right tools that can transform society. I'm also convinced that youth development efforts like this including those related to civic leadership, we will ensure that young people in policymaking are involved in both the design and the evaluation of these interventions. Research also shows us that the age and stage of development of young people is associated with certain attitudinal and behavioral characteristics, such as creativity, risk-taking, resilience, adaptation, as well as uh, the desire to learn. So as an organization, we are pleased to collaborate. And over the next coming months, we'll be mobilizing young people, mobilizing together with our partners, uh, Professor Wendy Parcel and Emerald Publishing, mobilizing all the book editors to ensure that the youth voice is integrated into this particular process. 
I also want to mention that this initiative that we are launching today is very much aligned to the recommendations of the Transforming Education Summit Action Track 5, which is building and maintain robust public digital learning content and platforms. And for us to be able to ensure that every young person, irrespective of where they are, have easy access to opportunities of learning, easy access to education, that would be the first step in accomplishing the goals. And as Mandela kept telling us, education is the only weapon that we can use to change the world. So thank you. And I look forward to this deliberation with you all. That's perfect, perfect. And I think, you know, lots of uh, engagement in the chat already. If I can encourage people who have questions for us and for the editors and for the students, if you could pop those into the Q&A. But can I thank you, Brighton, for your leadership and for your generosity, really, in uh, launching this uh, webinar series with us. So thank you to you and your team. Um, I'd now like just to take uh, the opportunity to in, in uh, kind of invite in some of our um, editors so they can tell us a bit more about about the books that they're planning and the books that they're busy writing um, as, as we speak. So our first one is to turn to President An Angel Cabrera, uh, who is the editor for uh, book SDG 17. And we think it's gonna be the first one uh, launched into the public uh, next year. And he's here together with his student and also his co-editor, Drew Cutright. So Angel, can I ask you to um, tell us a little bit about your book? Yeah, thank you so much, Wendy, and um, and thank you, K Katie, for the partnership and uh, great introduction uh, from from Brighton. Um, I'm I'm delighted to be to be part of this uh, very exciting project uh, together with my colleague Drew uh, Cutright. You know, the, this is um, uh, when when the very first uh, sort of global development effort, the, the Millennium Development Goals, was put together. Um, Academic institutions <clears throat> were uh, were missing from the table. Uh, individuals were, I mean, of course, uh, professors and in individual capacities were involved, but but institutionally we were not. Um, we've made some progress since then. I think now it's clear to everyone that academic institutions have to be a critical element in um, in achieving in achieving the goals. But what's become very very clear is that one of the most important roles that academic institutions uh, uh, can play in addition to educating and, and shaping the attitudes of, uh, uh, of of students and future change agents, and in addition to aligning our research and to producing uh, new solutions and innovative solutions to these very complex problems we face, is also uh, being the, the the hub of partnerships, being being conveners. We we have a unique position in society as as sort of a, a trusted conveners that can bring not only other universities, but also other types of institutions across uh, sectoral boundaries to, to, to work together. And um, so it made a lot of sense that Wendy uh, put the pressure on us and then we, we took the challenge of, of having, uh, starting with uh, goal 17 and, and hopefully we will make it as the first book in the series because of that absolutely essential uh, role uh, of, of partnerships, of, of, of how universities can add value by precisely setting up effective partnerships. Uh, the uh, We're very excited about the book because the book sort of will portray in each chapter a very different type of partnership. And, and we're trying to extract and work with the authors, not just to, to highlight what has worked, but also the areas of the pain points and the frustrations and, and, and try to have these folks who are uh, very busy creating these partnerships to to draw some lessons that can help others in different contexts to 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 do the same. So uh, uh, we we have, for example, a, a chapter that focuses on a on a partnership here at Georgia Tech uh, with the private sector. Uh, in uh, it's called the the Drawdown uh, uh, Georgia project, which is uh, trying to figure out in this case solutions for uh, for decarbonization of our local economy and trying to understand what are the leverages that we have here in, in the state of Georgia locally. And that is a, an example of um, universities sort of being a hub of a partnership with, um, uh, with business companies. Um, we have um, one of the greatest networks of, uh, of uh, higher education in the world, the Association of Commonwealth Universities. In this case is how a very large grouping of, of universities in very different contexts can come together 
to, uh, so in this case is university to university uh, partnership. Um, we, we have uh, another kind of university of university partnership that we're very, very excited to highlight in the book, which is the, uh, the Tech de Monterrey and a set of uh, global courses that they have created where they're connecting faculty to faculty to create a much more global dimension to courses that focus on specific aspects of the, uh, of the sustainable development goals. But one of the uh, one of the very very interesting um, um, projects that that we're also delighted to feature in the in the project, and we have uh, a student voice right here with us today, is the the Millennium uh, Fellowship. It's a it's a unique form of uh, also of partnership that goes directly to the student experience, and and perhaps uh, rather than hear it uh, from me, uh, I would invite uh, uh, Summer Wyatt from uh, uh, University College London uh, to, to let us know about the experience and how that's gonna be reflected in the, in the book. Summer? Thank you, Professor Cabrera. Um, and so for everyone that doesn't know, I was a Millennium Fellow Campus Director for 2021. And so that entailed overseeing 20 other Millennium Fellows and their projects as part of the overall Millennium Fellowship. The Millennium Campus Network focuses on global connections from student to student, from student to institution. So as part of the Millennium Campus Network's chapter, I was asked to provide my thoughts on dynamics and mechanics of effective partnerships between students and universities. And I wrote in the context of my own, in the context of my own fellowship project, working with five other UCL Millennium Fellows focusing on Sicily and London and the relationship between high schoolers and middle schoolers across basically Europe to learn about different stages of migration and engaging them through artwork. So in terms of empowering students, I believe that it's crucial for the universities and institutions that we all work with to consider the barriers and challenges that we face as students when trying to come up with social impact product projects, whether that be accessing funding, technology, resources or space. And in an ideal world, such universities would empower their students within their own institution by removing the hierarchies when we collaborate. And we believe that it's for us students to be empowered together to form partnerships towards the SDGs, such as the book is all about, and that the sooner the universities will recognize this and talk to see what we actually need, the better. And so the Millennium Campus Network provides each fellow tools and supports needed to be empathetic and um, empathetic and confident leaders. And so the fellowship gave me a newfound hope as a student by overseeing, collaborating and hearing with thousands of social impact projects globally was empowering and it truly sparked a fire that global youth could prevail to create a livable future. And the innovation, determination and desperation for fueling each student that I've worked with is both freeing and so the Millennium Campus Network will be changing the world, inspiring hundreds of thousands of youth worldwide to do the same. And I really encourage everybody here to take a look at the projects that students are working on, because they're really fantastic and look at each and every one of the sustainable development goals in a different way. But thank you. That's well, if there was any, uh, Wendy, if there was any doubt of why it was so important to have uh, student voices reflected, I guess, uh, summers presentation <laughs> answers all those questions and uh, with that I turn it I turn it back to you uh thank you and thank you very much uh President Cabrera for for being the editor for SDG 17 but also introducing us to some of your thoughts there and some are just um hope you mentioned hope there and I think that's just the the great part of this project and the dialogue uh with our students so thank you um I'm now going to invite uh, Ambassador Professor Sarah Mendelssohn together with her student Kristen uh just to tell us a little bit about your book book SDG 16 which is I know well advanced you're making great <laughs> progress so tell us a little bit about that thank you Thank you, Wendy. Thank you, Katie, and for Emerald's dedication to this and to SDSN youth. Um, I served at the U.S. mission to the U.N. as the U.S. ambassador to ECOSOC from 2015 to 2017. And when I was there, I was convinced that youth, or what I call Cohort 2030, were absolutely critical to advancing this agenda, uh, in part because I think of what Brighton said about risk-taking and seeing the world in a different way. So 
pretty much everything I've tried to do since leaving USUN has been to try and figure out the best ways to mobilize. Uh, and universities are an absolutely critical piece. And the, the, the series is going to be a really foundational uh, piece of work. Let me talk a little bit about the substance of the book before uh, handing it off to Kristen. So even before the pandemic, uh, for a variety of reasons, many scholars, experts, colleagues, we're feeling that the traditional way of teaching and researching about human rights needed a refresh. Um, out of multiple crises, we have, uh, in fact, opportunities. And I'm excited to edit this volume because we're going to explore uh, how we ground an emerging paradigm shift, how to field build the next generation that approaches human rights with a different set of lens and skills. So this edited volume emerges and builds on multiple convenings, including discussions on the topic in summer 2021 and 20, 2020 and 2021 during the Brookings Institution and Rockefeller Foundation flagship 17 rooms exercise. It also builds on a workshop we convened this uh, summer in The Hague during the World Justice Forum. Uh, the edited volume will explore the globally agreed to framework of the SDGs, the leave no one behind ethos, and what we think of as the 16 plus agenda of advancing peaceful, just and inclusive societies through case studies in a handful of cities and communities and this approach puts a greater emphasis on reducing inequality and inequity, advances an understanding of sustainability in the round beyond environmental issues, as well as a universal conception of development. This is not just about the global south or things international, but applies domestically in the US. It recognizes the interdependence of the SDGs and the need to reduce silos between domestic and international work. Uh, so we're excited to see a number of case studies, and you're going to hear a little bit about one that really focuses on whether or not the recovery from the pandemic has been just uh, in Pittsburgh, Atlanta, and Toronto. And I'm sad to say that we're finding both, in many cases, missing disaggregated data, but also not yet the just recovery that we were hoping to, to find. Uh, but we're also we're very focused on th this kind of research as experiential learning at the moment in which students, scholars, practitioners require a new set of skills and understanding to address these complex interactions among economic, social, political, and environmental systems. So we see the book as a cross-cutting approach to researching and teaching critical issues of our time. Um, the book is interdisciplinary in the sense that we have well-established authors in the field of human rights, but it moves well beyond the legal frameworks that you traditionally see as the milieu for human rights. Uh, and it does emphasize this interconnected aspect of the SDGs, particularly with a focus on socioeconomic rights. And of course, it involves um, students. Now, before I pass it to Kristen, let me just close by saying how important it is that universities have em emerged as stable platforms to advance the SDGs. As someone involved in the creation of the SDGs, that was not the focus of anticipation, but it is a huge welcome turn of events. It's certainly been the place where I work, uh, Carnegie Mellon University, and I expect this volume and others in the series are gonna add to the SDG movement to fundamental growing the next generation is what I call, again, cohort 2030 and reaching far beyond, beyond academia. Over to you, Kristen, to take us home. Great, thank you so much for the introduction and thank you all for inviting me here today. And my name is Kristen Hockrader and I'm one of the students that worked on evaluating the impacts of COVID-19 relief spending on the historic inequities in Pittsburgh, Toronto, and Atlanta. I do first want to start with some positives about these three cities that we looked at. I think it's really important to call attention to especially some of the national level work on SDG reporting that's happening in Canada on the Statistics Canada website. There are infographics and national level statistics on advancement at the national level related to the 2030 goals. And in Pittsburgh, they even published a local voluntary review, which was in part published uh, by a Heinz student. Um, and while this work is really great and it's important to see that there's this focus, one thing that we found as part of our research is that there's a large gap when we're looking at the data. And part of that was already mentioned, there is a lack of quality disaggregated city level data in all three of these cities that we looked at, which really makes it difficult to create an impactful policy that's going to advance the SDGs and really look at communities on a granular level instead of at an aggregated level. 
in order for COVID-19 relief spending to have been impactful at reducing the historic inequities that existed in all three of these cities prior to the start of the pandemic, that funding would have needed to be targeted at those communities most marginalized. And what we found is that wasn't the case. Most of the communities that had the most access to those funds were those that already had um, higher access to funds and support prior to COVID and who had access to political power. And because of that, when we looked at the data we were able to find that was disaggregated by race and sex, we found that those gaps that existed not only haven't shrunk, but are widening, especially as we were projecting these trends out to 2030. And if we had more access to data, I imagine that what we would find is even more stark. So I think it's really important to recognize that cities have been the leaders on the SDGs and are going to continue to be. That city level data is so critical for city leaders and policymakers to be able to understand the real lived experiences of the residents of their city to make policies that are truly going to impact their lives and make true impactful changes related to sustainable development. And that was really what our work focused on as students was trying to highlight these challenges in the data gaps that exist in the realms of food insecurity, unemployment, internet access, health and housing, so that all three of these cities would have the awareness of how important disaggregated and city level data is so that they can fix this problem moving forward um, and also partner for, with local institutions of higher learning. I think students can play such an impactful role in gathering this data to bridge the gap between nonprofits and those institutions that do have data um, that's at least privately held. And that was really what we wanted our work to highlight um, because this is a solvable and fixable problem. So thank you all so much for thank you. your time and for allowing me to speak today. Oh, thank you so much, Kristen. And thank you so much to Sarah Mendelson and for all your, all your work. And also, Kristen, can I thank you for giving a perfect segue to uh, SDG 11, uh, as I invite in Professor Julio Lumbreras from University Politecnica Madrid, together with his student, Alessandro. So Julio, talk to us about your book with uh, your co-editor, Jamie, as well. Great. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Purcell. Thank you for the invitation. Great. Thank you, SDSN Youth, and congratulations for the event. So I'm more than happy to, to share here with you the idea of uh, book uh, number 11 related to SDG 11 on sustainable cities. And I want to give the floor very quickly to Alejandro, who's the real, you know, the <laughs> student is the, uh, the, the player here. So, so I don't want to spend much time, but just to show you the idea of the book, which is to show and showcase that the university can play a different role to support urban transformation worldwide and how university could do a bit more than research and teaching, which is, of course, very important, but how they can play a different role to promote, to foster urban transformation. So we are at the beginning of the book, the first chapter, well, after the introduction, we talk about the, the role of universities in urban transformations. Then we talk about how universities can equip city of officials, then how they could be conveners uh, of multiple stakeholders with example of the city of Boston, then the idea of university as a place where collective intelligence can happen and can gain scale and can different countries, different cities from different countries can work together both at the national level at, um, at the greater level, in this case at the European level with the European cities mission. Then also some examples across the globe. So we have some examples from, from Australia, some examples that they started in Canada, the city studio, but now it's international. Some examples from Latin America, from Africa, and finally from China and from, uh, yeah, two from, from China, from Tsinghua University and Tongji University. So that's the idea to, to showcase that it's possible to play a different role. And it's not only possible, but it's necessary. We need a different role from the universities and, and we, can, we can make it happen. And this will make a difference in the cities because most of the universities are urban universities are within, within a city and they are in many cases by themselves just cities right so it's a great opportunity to 
transform our goal and to implement the SDGs. But with uh, no more delay, I appreciate the presence of Alejandro, who was the chair of the students of the university, 40,000 students. So he was uh, chairing the group and I very much appreciate his attendance. Thank you, Alejandro. No, oh, we can't we hear you. We don't have sound. Try. You can hear me now? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Just a second. So, so you can hear me now? Okay. So thank you, Professor Lumbreras. Thanks to all the attendees to this panel. And especially thank you to the SDSN for your leadership on this very important matter. So my name is Alejandro Gutierrez. As Professor Lumbreras said, I was the chair, the student chair for more than 40,000 students in the Universidad Politecnica de Madrid. And I'm a proud member of the European Student Alliance. And I wanted to tell you a bit about uh, what was our strategy uh, as uh, empowering students into social transformation and into the SDGs. Um, as a student, uh, as a student chair, we focused on both a mission and a vision. Our mission was a model which was people, students, and representatives in this order, uh, gaining ground on the, on the acquisition that we are interested on in putting people first into community building. That has to be the first aspect into the SDG number 11, into community building by, by putting people first. And our vision uh, is embranched in a theoretical uh, framework, which is the triple helix of innovation by Mr. Karajanis. This triple helix, uh, uh, admits that there are three main actors in the into building innovation university government and industry as a student chair i was more focused on the on the university part and more specifically in the students part of university as here in spain more than 80 percent of the university population is made up of students so we should empower all this innovation through students not just because of the number of people we have here but also for the intergenerational values that we can have moving forward into the next um into the next 10 20 30 years in fact agenda 2030 is focusing on this on this future uh, viewpoint so um we theorize because this uh, model has evolved through the fifth uh, helix of innovation to emerging helixes and one of these emerging helixes could actually be a student we can actually empower students through specific actions involving us into governance into um, into interdisciplinary projects such as the one mentioned by Professor Lumbreras, the missions uh, into the cities to reorganize our our views on how communities has to be have to be built with the voices of the students being heard not just being heard but developed throughout all the project in collaboration with peers in collaboration with teachers with uh, the governance of the universities and also uh, supranational governances such as the European Union but um, how can we do this in a specific actions we can go through the real voices for example the ones that we had as uh, student representatives into um, specific organs of governance. Second, by the interaction with other students, because innovation can come through the interactions uh, between not just students into the same universities, but with universities from all around the world by connecting into universities alliances, such as the ones developed in Europe. And finally, through uh, connecting the educational values, because this can also be a format, uh, this can also be formative, this can also uh, help educate uh, the students to to have uh, in, in to have in future generations uh, real innovators and real social entrepreneurs. So uh, overall, uh, these helixes I I talked to you about uh, focus in three main aspects, which are the empowerment, which are the engagement of the students. And finally, I'd like to tell you that we have to go for, from a view of a students as a reactive uh, force to a proactive force that can actually help shape governance and can actually reshape communities, helping us go through the SDG number 11 and can help us go through uh, renewed communities for the world of today, but also for the world of tomorrow by the people of today and the people of tomorrow. So thank you very much.
Uh, perfect. If ever there was a, you know, a, a case to talk about the power of the student voice, you just captured it so beautifully. Thank you so much, Julio. Thank you, Alexander. Um, I'm also now going to turn to uh, SDG4. And we have our president, Tawana Coupe. I'm just going to ask Amy to set the video up. So President Professor Tawana Coupe, who is the president of the University of Pretoria, um, has uh, unfortunately not been able to join us live, has sent us a video, just a very short video to introduce uh, his book to us. Um, but we're also joined by his colleague, Dr. Brian Chickson and Samantha Castle uh, for the student voice. So if we could set that video up um, and share. Hello, I'm Professor Tawana Kobe, Vice Chancellor and Principal of the University of Pretoria, one of Africa's top universities. We undertake socially impactful research to find solutions for the world's most pressing issues. And we focus on high quality teaching and learning to support the development of responsible citizens fully prepared for the world beyond university. I'm delighted to be the editor of book SDG4 in the series, Higher Education and the Sustainable Development Goals working with Wendy Purcell, a series editor and Emerald Publishing. Let me be clear. I think that higher education is making a powerful contribution to the delivery of the SDGs. And we do so by mobilizing youth as scholars, leaders, entrepreneurs, and professionals. My book focuses on SDG4, quality education the aim of which is to ensure inclusive and equitable quality education and promote lifelong learning opportunities for all. The book plans to adopt a thematic approach. We'll cover the global higher education ecosystem, exploring equal opportunities in education and building capacity for impact. We shall highlight the need to broaden engagement and be more responsive to society's needs. We also look forward to, to issuing a call to action for the sector to address sustainable development. At all times, the book will highlight the central role of students and at every level and as lifelong learners to help cre to create a world that leaves no one behind. I know this is the kickoff event for this exciting 17 book series. And I look forward to telling you more in a future webinar. For now, I leave you in the capable hands of my colleague, Dr. Brian Chickson, and our wonderful student, Samantha Castle. Thank you for inviting me to join you and have a wonderful event. Oh, excellent. Thank you very much to uh, President uh, Tawane Coupe. Um, um, I'm going to do as the President suggested, is to come to you, Samantha and uh, Samantha Castles, a PhD student there. So maybe you could tell us a little bit about your thoughts on this space. Hi, good day, everybody. And thank you so much for the opportunity. I really um, appreciate the opportunity to, to be part of this really important discussion. Um, of course, uh, I am a PhD student at the University of Pretoria. And my PhD research really focuses on looking um, at enabling leadership um, enabling leadership for innovation in the pursuit of the sustainable development goals. Um, if it was up to me and if I could advocate to add another sustainable development goals, I would definitely add leadership um, high up there as SDG 18 um, in order to make sure that we actually, through leadership, um, facilitate the impact um, uh, of delivering on the SDGs. Um, higher education, of course, plays an immensely critical role in making sure that we deliver on this mandate um, and also to address the complex challenges that we face. It really excites me the opportunity with this book um, to look at how do we actually unpack the practical ways in which universities are intentionally driving the SDGs, but more importantly, what are the practical ways that we are building capabilities um, from institutions. Um, and increasingly in a world where, you know, it's become completely polarized, uh, how do we navigate issues around collaboration, uh, around transdisciplinary research? Um, how do we navigate issues of trust um, in building that capabilities 
uh, amongst leaders. Um, we obviously know at in, as institutions, um, higher education institutions are uh, responsible for re preparing skilled professionals for the industries. Um, so how are we preparing these um, uh, skilled leaders across multiple spheres. It's not enough just to be an economist. It's not enough just to be an engineer. And so, so what are those kind of capabilities that we are instilling um, uh, as leaders in our university? Um, also, secondly, we know that, you know, it's through innovative research that we find solutions for complex um, problems. But more importantly for me, I also want to understand and hopefully it's an opportunity to discuss and put in this domain and, and, and maybe through some of the research that comes out as well as some of the articles that will be written as part of this book is looking at the element of how are leaders um, within higher education themselves transforming to make sure that they contribute to institutions that remain relevant and accessible for societies. So again, I would like to uh, really thank you for the opportunity to be part of this discussion. And I'm looking forward to the exciting things that's going to be um, illustrated and come through in this book. Um, but more importantly, if I may just end off by again advocating for leadership being a primary uh, SDG as well to underpin some of these issues. Thank you. Hear, hear to that. And uh, Brian, do you want to um, just share some of thank your thoughts about uh, SDG4 on the book? Yeah, thank, thank you, Wendy, and thank you, Sam. I'm sure you can all see the, the passion and the excitement that's coming from our side in relation to SDGs, SDG4, and the book that we're doing. But in conclusion, I'd like to acknowledge that we, we, we are particularly fortunate in co coordinating this specific SDG book. Um, SDG4, Quality Education, is at the heart of who we are. It is at the heart of, of what we do. Um, and, and it's particularly timely given, given the, the deep self-reflection that is underway across higher education around our relevance and our contribution to society. Okay. So our, our planning is well underway. We are engaging with uh, potential contributors across a global footprint. Um, and along with our integrated thematic approach, we anticipate integrating the student voice uh, our voice for the future of the future. And we believe an insuffici insufficiently tapped source of talent and, and innovation. Uh, we'd like to integrate that throughout the course of the book. Uh, for instance, um, Sam's work, uh, perspectives on leadership will be a fresh and relevant uh, view as a critical component of building capability uh, through, through quality education. I mean, it could also play in terms of when we look at how SDG4 connects with all of the other SDGs and the, and the, and the, the glue of leadership making things happen in a cross-cutting way. So thank you. Thank you very much. We're looking forward to this year and we're, we're, we're pretty excited about it. Thank you so much. Thanks for all your work. And I love the, as you say, SDG4 as the book is really important. I love the thematic approach that you're taking to that. We've got lots of questions coming in and I know time is always running. This is just a taster. And so what the future series of this webinar series will do is to take uh, one of the books, some of the chapters of those books, some of the students that are involved and we'll take a deep dive and we'll have a nice series. I'll tell you a bit more about that at the end. I'm gonna see if we can get to some of our questions. If I could, ask, I'm gonna to come to you, Summer. I don't know if you saw, there's a lovely question for you. I hope you've been looking at that and thinking about it. So um, there's a great question here from Christine saying thank you so much to uh, Summer. She's really happy to see you here. But uh, could you tell us maybe one of those tangible resources that emerged from the work that you were doing um something that they should just not miss out on maybe summer i know it's putting you on the spot a little bit but maybe you could tell us about that so i loved your enthusiasm for the project of course no that's a really really good question and it's really hard to pinpoint just one um actually <laughs> i'd say don't miss out on any of the resources because they're all fantastic um, but one that I found extremely useful was the portal that we have access to as a fellow, which means we can reach out to every other fellow that has been through the program since its concoction um, and be able to engage with other students globally and arrange meetings, whether that be online or in person. And I would say definitely don't like leave that resource till the last minute to 
you use it from like moment one and make sure that you have use that as much as you can to make those human connections to try and just boost your project in every way you can and engage with other people as well yeah i think you're really pointing to that sense of community and i do hope that um, this webinar series can also kind of link into that because I do think that connection am among those communities is so important. I'm going to come to Katie. There's quite a few questions, Katie, about how do people get access to the book? Um, how can they reach out if they've got interest? And there's loads of interest. I'm going to keep all the chat and get back to people. Uh, and also maybe just give us a window on the timeline of all the different books. We've got nine commissioned um you know eight more to go and so they're coming off you know off the hopper at different times so maybe tell us how can we get hold of the books how can people engage if they've got ideas uh and the timeline so. yeah absolutely so i'm very excited to say that we should be publishing our first book in the series in spring next year so we're looking at around uh may provisionally may 2023 that we'll be publishing our first book and um, so we're very excited about that and um, all of the books will be available both in print and in ebook form uh, and um there's no links yet in terms of being able to sort of pre-order as we're, we've not actually um received the the first version of the manuscript but as soon as we're able to share um and announce the book um online then we'll be able to uh, to share links to that. Um, as at, at the present, there is a website which uh, my colleague Lauren has just very helpfully sh shared in the chat. So Thanks, Lauren. Good morning, Lauren. Um, and that is where you can um, read a little bit more about the series. And also there is both mine and Wendy's contact information on that series page. So if anyone does have interest in uh, contributing to the series then please do get in touch uh, with myself and Wendy via that contact information um, and then yeah in terms of timeline obviously I've just kind of mentioned uh, what we're thinking in terms of the first book that's going to publish um, but equally in terms of um, contributing or writing a proposal um, we're just being very invitational there is no deadline in terms of um, submitting a proposal um, and, and Wendy's outlined those opportunities that remain available in terms of the books for which we do not yet have editors. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I think the opportunity here for us is just to be really invitational and that if you do want to contribute, then please do get in touch. Thanks so much. I'm good to see if I could maybe invite Drew to, um, to give us uh, a response. There's a couple of questions here, Drew. So Drew is a co-editor for SDG 17, the first book that we think will be published in the series. Um, there's a couple of questions here, Drew, that I think you might be able to uh, comment on. So Rushia is asking, how do you think people might use these books? Um, and we're also getting uh, a, a comment here from Steen, who's saying, what do you think these books, how do you think they might be used practically? So thinking about you know, the content of SDG 17 in your book and how do you see them being used uh, potentially? You've got some fantastic stories in your uh, in your book. So maybe just give us some thoughts, Drew. Thanks, Wendy, and, and thanks, thanks for so the much. questions. Um, I think that with this volume and with partnerships in general, it's such a broad topic and a broad SDG, much like most of them. Um, that it was very difficult to narrow down um, where we wanted to focus with this volume because there are no shortage of amazing partnerships in higher education to advance the SDGs. So uh, in general, we tried to provide examples of higher education partnering with different sectors, um, and we tried to have geographic diversity um, and, and really let the authors ground their chapters in their personal experiences and um, lessons learned. So, so I think that there's a wide variety of applications depending on which angle you're coming from. Um, we have specific case studies in some of our chapters. So for example, the Georgia Tech chapter that's working with uh, businesses in Georgia uh, on a climate action compact. Um, is, is a very specific example. Uh, and you know they provide examples of kind of how they created this partnership. Uh, a bit of a spoiler alert, it's not easy and it takes a lot of time. Um, as, as I think all of us know who work on partnerships for the SDGs. Um, 
And then we also have examples from, you know, University of Cape Town is one of our contributors who's uh, talking about how they've developed relationships with local government. So um, it's not necessarily that we provided a how-to guide here, um, but I think that there are how-tos throughout the book. And we do refer to some, there are some really great resources out there on forming partnerships around the SDGs that we reference um, throughout the book. And um, I would say in general, we tried to pro provide a really wide variety um, and, and inspire people and encourage people to think about the strengths at their institutions and personally and how they might form better partnerships um, to, to make a difference in their area of focus. So thank you. Thank you, Drew. And thanks for all the work that you and uh, the president are doing. He talked about a little bit of pressure. So just a little bit of pressure uh, um, to get that uh, moving along, which is fantastic. It's great to see the progress. I'm going to finish up now with a fantastic question, which I'm going to invite all of you just to give your thoughts to. Um, Habida has uh, sent a question in saying, do you think it's necessary for higher education students to be enrolled in an economic, a social or a political faculty to uh, be part of achieving the SDGs? Now, my short response is no, every discipline has a contribution to make to the SDGs, but I'd be interested in your thoughts. How are the SDGs showing up in your different discipline areas? So um, maybe I could start off with you from our student council and UPM. Alessandro, do you want to say, do you feel you could be in any discipline and make a contribution to the SDGs? For sure. Can you hear yeah. me now? Yes, we can Okay. Hear you. So I totally agree with you, Wendy. It is not necessary at all. First of all, I have to say myself, I'm a biotechnologist. So that's a good example of uh, not being necessary to to be in this kind of disciplines um and i have to say that uh future projects and 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 nowadays projects in with regard to to sdgs are based on a multidisciplinary basis uh so uh, we cannot understand uh, the 21st century reality with just one uh, single focus but we need focus from every single discipline and when I say every single discipline my point of view is that uh, no discipline should be taken out because um, co uh, challenges of today are being more complex uh, more difficult to to assess and for that uh, scientific engineering cultural values uh, uh, this is so so important in order to solve this and uh, for sure I, I i believe it's not necessary to 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 address these specific areas economics politics etc yeah and julio and then yeah. brian yeah thank you so just want to add that I fully agree with Alejandro and with this idea of uh, interdisciplinarity to implement the SDGs. And I think at the urban level is when this is landed because all the challenges cities are facing are intertwined, are complex, are adaptive, and they need the intervention from very different disciplines. So if you need, if you want to solve let's say the mobility, for example, to become more sustainable, then you need the combination of technology plus policy, plus uh, behavioral change, plus uh, economical incentives for people to change and so on and so forth. So I think at the city level is where you can see this. And one example that could be interesting is our ELISA University program that you, Professor Purcell, know about it, of eight universities across Europe working on a different way to teach our engineering students. And during the whole the time they are in, this, in the university, they will be showing and accrediting the impact on changing our society. So from its discipline, they can work on a specific projects that they are related to transform a part of our society. And that's a way they can engage throughout all the courses they are taking across the four or six years of studies and then implementing at many different levels, but in particular, the urban level. Thank you. Perfect. I mean, I think it is very much, I've come to Brian now, but it's very much that sense of, you know, creating a world that leaves no one behind. We must make sure we need low discipline uh, behind as well. So it's really important. Brian, you had some some comments to make here. Yeah. Yeah. In, our, yeah. in our minds, I mean, there's no debate about it. It's it's everybody's business. Uh, yeah, perfect. But we've, take, we've, take, we've taken it a step further, right? And said, look, in terms of our university institutional strategy, 
we've integrated and hardwired sustainable development and by extension, the SDGs into the institutional strategy so that when it's cascaded through the functions and also through our core uh, process like teaching, learning, research and um, engagement, they're hardwired and weaved in. And when we play them out in our transdisciplinary way, we do it across faculties because of transdisciplinarity. So, so yeah, that's, it, 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 it must become our bread and butter. Yeah, great question. I talk to um, everyone I talk to, I talk about putting your SDG goggles on, you know, put on your SDG goggles and look afresh at uh, your discipline, at your teaching, at your research, at the community work that you're doing and everything else. Summer, uh, Samantha, any comments, anything else you wanted to say? And then I might leave the final word to Brighton. Uh, did I see Katie's hand up as well? No? Okay, good. Well, um, let me just tell you uh, two things then before we just close out. One is that um, this is the beginning. Uh, we're going to come back with a series of webinars where we'll take a deeper dive on the topics, on the books, the chapters, the students involved. We hope that there'll be one coming up in October, another in November. We'll come back to you with details about that. Um, the STSN, there will be a recording of this so you can look back. We will mine the chat for all your comments, connections, the ideas that you've been sharing, as well as the other questions, and we'll hope to keep that communication going. But uh, maybe I could hand back to, to Brighton to close this out. Would that be okay? Absolutely. You know, very, very pleased and very excited that we had incredible people join us today. I think to all of our partners that have made this event a reality. This is just the beginning of what is going to be an exciting series of events. And uh, I would like to just reiterate on behalf of SDS in youth that we continue to have our renewed hope and enthusiasm about what we can do together. And I would like to invite all of you to be on the lookout for the next coming events uh, from the webinar series that we're going to be hosting with young people and the book editors. Uh, we hope that you can continue to engage with us. Um, and uh, as always, remember to tweet, tag us, uh, <laughs> your tweets online, and let's continue the conversation. Other than that, thank you so much, and I look forward to our continued engagement. Thank you so much. Um, Katie, did you want to uh, just sign off just as we um, close out the room? Absolutely. Thank you very much, everyone, for joining. You kind of took the words out of my mouth earlier, Wendy, when you were saying, you know, the, the intention of the SDGs to, is to leave no one behind. And in the same way, we want as many people as possible involved in this conversation that we're having, yeah. Um, yeah. including students. So this is an amazing endeavour and we're, at Emerald, we're very, very pleased to be involved. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. So, um, Formally, we're closed. We're closed out. Thank you so much. Uh, thanks to all of the panellists, the incredible students that they brought with us. Um, and look out for not only the books as they emerge next year, but also the series of webinars that will be coming up um, over the coming months. So I wish you a, a good rest of day, uh, wherever it is in the day. And thank you for joining us. Thank you all very much.